You're listening to the Voice of Russia in London. I'm Daniel Sinner. The European Union is to officially receive the Nobel Peace Prize at a ceremony in Oslo. The first Nobel Prize was given in 1901, an award set up after the death of Alfred Nobel, a Swedish chemist and the inventor of dynamite, who left the bulk of his fortune to establish the honour. The prize recognises achievements in physics, chemistry, physiology or medicine, as well as literature, peace and economics. The chairman of the Nobel Committee says the EU has transformed Europe from a continent of wars to a continent of peace. Instead of focusing on the current European crisis of economic problems and soaring unemployment, the Nobel Committee have focused on the work that the EU has done over the past 60 years. Back in the 1950s, the EU was just six countries who agreed to work together on coal and steel production. Now it has 27 member states and a new one on the way with Croatia soon to join next year. But with Greece's future in the euro bloc in danger, raging unemployment in Spain and the very future of the eurozone under threat, is this the right time to award the EU the Nobel Prize for Peace? Or is it finally being recognised as a force for good? Joining me for a discussion on the Nobel Prize for Peace are Ian Dunt, editor of politics.co.uk. Dr Henning Mayer is a senior visiting fellow at the London School of Economics and Political Science and also the editor of the Social Europe Journal. Mark Pack is co-editor of the Liberal Democrat Voice and Friedrich Heffermel is the author of the Nobel Peace Prize, What Nobel Really Wanted. Ian Dunn, editor of politics.co.uk, do you think the European Union deserves the Nobel Peace Prize? Uh, no, I don't. I think it's quite absurd that it received it. And in fact, at the moment, it is probably one of the largest reasons for discord and a rise in nationalism on this continent right now. So it's almost ironic and a little bit tragic that it's been awarded to it. Mark Pack from the Liberal Democrat Voice. Uh, unlike Ian, I take almost the exact opposite view. I think it's right that the EU has received the Nobel Peace Prize. And in fact, the current tensions within uh, Europe actually demonstrate why it's a worthy winner, because those tensions aren't being accompanied by troops being mobilised, navies being sent to sea and so on in the way that previous centuries would have seen happen. Dr Henning Mayer from the London School of Economics. Well, I agree with Mark. I mean, I think the EU fully deserves the, the Peace Prize because, as you know, it's not just about the politics of recent years, but about the historic achievement. And this is unrivaled. So there's clearly a case to award it to the European Union. Um, and Frederick Heffermel. My view is that you have to ask what Nobel intended, and he was for disarmament, a global disarmament. The EU is doing exactly the opposite. It will have a summit this um, uh, Friday uh, to uh, increase uh, military cooperation. So if we do go on to what Nobel really wanted, obviously Nobel being a Swedish chemist and the inventor of the dynamite, he wanted to change that with the bulk of his fortune, which he left to establish the honour. What, what did he really want that money to go towards? Well, he had five prizes, but the one was not for peace, but for the champions of peace. And he explained very clearly that this was for a demilitarized global order. He called it a fraternity of nations who would uh, abolish or reduce military forces. Uh, and he mentioned also the peace congresses, which was a reference to the 1890s uh, Universal Peace Con Conferences, which tried to establish a law in the international community uh, rather than the use of force and military power games. So it was, uh, this is a prize which is vital for the survival of mankind. Yeah, much more so in our time than in Nobel's time. We have lived or survived by great luck the nuclear weapons for 60 years, but it may any time wipe us off the globe. Mark Pack, from what you just heard from Friedrich Heppermel, the champions of peace, is that what the EU's done? Does it recognise that? Um, the EU's record certainly is not perfect, but then, you know, who of us has a, has a perfect record? Uh, it's interesting the reference that he made to the 1890s and those international conferences and so on, because I think one of the EU's contributions has been to help see a much greater emphasis on abiding by international law. Now, international law is often broken. It's not, you know, treated with the same respect and importance as domestic law. But the very fact that 
senior politicians are regularly having to refer to lawyers and feeling that it's the right thing to do before making decisions about military intervention and so on, I think is a major step forward. We're clearly got a long way to go before we get to that sense of you know a world that's permanently in peace but we have made a huge step forward and i think the eu has been a major part of that in the last 50 years ian dunt from politics.co.uk how far away do you think we are from this legacy that uh, you've just heard from friedrich heffermel oh we're very far away from that legacy indeed i mean it, it would it kind of escaped anyone's attention that on the day this was being announced we were still seeing riots in athens we're still seeing a very worrying trend towards um associations of Germany with old World War II images of Fourth Reich, especially in um, countries like Spain and Portugal and Greece. These tensions are being created because there is a massive problem with having an economic union without a political union. And therefore, you lose sovereignty, you lose a sense of national control. Um, and, and with that comes resentment, anger and violence. So the EU does absolutely nothing to abide by all the, the principles that uh, Nobel would have originally espoused. But even from the words of the chairman of the Nobel Committee, he says we're looking at the work that they've done in the past 60 years, not necessarily what they're doing well, now. I think that's highly questionable. I mean, if, if you really look at the most important fact of why there's been peace in Europe throughout, it's because all of these countries are capitalist democracies. Capitalist democracies do not go to war with each other. There are actually some complications with that. I would suggest some... First World War. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's a bit dodgy. I mean, Dr. Major, do you want to come in there? Yeah, I mean, uh, the thing is, I think it's undeniable that the European Union has been a force for peace, especially on the European continent. That's what we're talking about. I mean, being a German myself, I can tell you, uh, if you look at European history and you can compare it to the last 60 years, there is absolutely no doubt whatsoever that it has been a big... Uh, project for peace. I mean, when we're talking about world peace, that's obviously a different cup of tea. But uh, and you can also but discuss that is the Nobel idea. Yeah, but you, know, you can always discuss, uh, you know, who deserves the Nobel Peace Prize. I mean, Henry Kissinger uh, in the past was another <laughs> uh, contentious uh, uh, award. Uh, let's put it that way. But in, uh, what, for what they gave the European Union the prize for, and if you listen to the explanation given by the Nobel Committee. It was for the achievement of peace on the European continent over the last 60 years. Well, I agree, obviously, that we are now domestically in Europe in a very tricky economic situation. And there's a lot to be said about this. But this is a different topic altogether, disconnected from this peace press, I think. But the thing is, are you not concerned that you might be confusing correlation with causation? I haven't heard any arguments for why it should be the EU that explains why we haven't had any war for the last 50 years. In fact, why don't we look at the fact that these countries are trading with each other. That can happen perfectly easily, as you know, we see with the North American Free Trade Agreement or whatever, you know, without having a political and econ a full-on economic union. That seems like it has a much greater causal explanation than the fact that we've wrapped ourselves into an innately contradictory economic and political system. Uh, no, I mean, this is a very British uh, view on this, if, you, if, I, if I might say so, because it, it was no coincidence that the European Union and economic integration started with coal and steel industries because that was the armament sector. So there was not, yeah. you didn't start with the service sector or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the origin of, of why this drive to, you know, integrate economies much more was to have a joint supervision also about the means of violence, of, you know, of waging war. So there was a, there's a clear evidence. I mean, uh, I don't think that can be in any doubt. And I think also if you look up, look at the run up to the First World War, you know, there were all sorts of optimists pre-1914 who were saying, look at this immense amount of economic integration there is between countries. Surely, you know, war is soon going to be a thing of the past and so on. Turned out to be horribly, tragically wrong. And I think what has been different post-1945 has been not just the level of economic integration, which makes economic self-interest point against war, but that didn't work in the past, but also that cultural change. You know, what happens when there's tensions between Germany and Greece? Angela Merkel goes to Greece, people riot, not German warships get sent to the Mediterranean. That's the big difference from the past, and it's a cultural shift, I'm which I think the EU has played a role in. Uh, uh, excuse me, the, you, you, you leave the purpose of Nobel. This is a will. It's based, uh, the prize is uh, the implementation of a will which uh, contained a very specific peace plan. And the general discussion of peace, you can, this can go on forever, but... The question is, what did Nobel mean? You have a very clear legal obligation to abide by the mandate. Uh, and you have to discuss, uh, is this EU, um, there was talk here that it's, it's a step forward in um, uh, practicing international law in, in the field that Nobel wished to build international law to a point where all nations could disarm. The EU is a disaster. It contains in its uh, fundamental treaties uh, an obligation to strengthen uh, 
uh, common uh, military achievements and forces, and it uh, has uh, uh, plans now, uh, which will be uh, a new summit in Brussels on uh, f this Friday, will spit in the face of the price they are receiving today by uh, uh, going to adopt uh, a plan for close uh, co military cooperation and development of military force. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London with me, Daniel Sinner. Joining me for a discussion on the Nobel Peace Prize are Ian Dunt, editor of politics.co.uk. Dr Henning Mayer is a senior visiting fellow at the London School of Economics and Political Science and also the editor of the Social Europe Journal. Mark Pack is co-editor of the Liberal Democrat Voice. And Friedrich Heffermel is the author of the Nobel Peace Prize, What Nobel Really Wanted. Dr. Mayer, yeah, spitting in the face of the Nobel Prize Award. No, I mean, I mean, if you argue like this, you could say that the committee uh, continuously disregards the spirit of the will, right? I mean, because what, you, what you're saying is, is true for at least a half of the, of the recipients that I can think of. So, I mean, is it, is, is it a general point you're making about the interpretation of the committee, of the, of the will of Nobel, or is it a point about the EU in particular? No. It, it is really a point. The, the, the committee is not interpreting the will. They are doing exactly what they like. They are developing their own ideas and their own agendas. Uh, which they, This is a prize uh, which was entrusted by Nobel to the Norwegian parliament. They should appoint a committee of five. And Nobel obviously expected them to appoint a, a committee of persons committed to international global disarmament and having this as a, de a devotion to the, the peace ideas he wanted to pro propose them to. Um, so the problem is the committee. Promote. The but problem is the committee, not the EU, as the recipient of this year's prize. The problem is the committee and its interpretation, and not the EU as the recipient of this year's prize. It is not a res uh, an interpretation. They ha are not looking at the will at all. They are uh, d promoting their own ideas for, for peace in general. And this permits the parliament and the committee to do whatever they like. So it has been transformed from its Nobel's Prize only in name. The reality is that this is the Nor official Norwegian parliament prize and nothing else. I think one of the problems there often is when trying to interpret somebody's wishes years after they have died is how do you deal with changing circumstances and it strikes me there there are a lot of people who were alive at the time Nobel created his prize and who continue to live many years beyond him much further into the 20th century and many of them we know did change their attitude towards the best ways of bringing about uh, global peace from a ve a, often a very strong belief in disarmament being the best way in the 20s and 30s and then seeing the experience of the Second World War and deciding to seek peace in a different way. And indeed, that, you know, the creation of the EU was, whether or not we think it was successful in this, was one of those different ways. So it seems to me there, in terms of the spirit of Nobel, um, you know, the way the prize is currently being handed out for all the controversies over individual years and so on actually does very much meet the spirit of, uh, of the, the intention about trying to increase the amount of peace in the world. My hunch is actually that... The re one of the reasons it was it was granted to the EU was because there is a similar idea among the Nobel group and, and also in the EU, among the, the technocrats right at the top. And I think this idea has really gone through the whole of EU history, and it is that there's something innately violent, innately problematic about the nation state. And I think that when you scratch beneath the surface of a lot of the thinking around the EU, it is about trying to basically negate, to make impotent the nation state as if that is what caused war. And at the heart of that, of course, is a, is a complete misjudgment about why the Second World War took place, which is really about sort of fascism and race and conformity rather than about nationalism, as it is often interpreted. And that idea, I think, is what the Nobel Prize jury actually associate with the EU. It's what the people in Strasbourg uh, feel in exactly the same way. It's what the people in Brussels feel. And, and you see it throughout the entire project, this idea that the nation state is innately dangerous and innately warlike. And I think that actually happens to be an enormous misjudgment. Dr. Mayer. Yeah, well, I, would, I wouldn't agree with this. I mean, the European Union was set up to complement the nation state in particular areas uh, where, especially if you look at global problems we have today, I mean, there's very little doubt that we have a collective action problem and the European Union as a system of supranational governance is really set up to try uh, to tackle these issues on a, on a regional basis. So 
So uh, it's but not it's not to negate or sovereignty. It's economic sovereignty, for instance. I mean, of course, no one could deny yeah, sovereignty, the fact that the sovereignty EU takes away shared, economic sovereignty. Yeah, sho- sovereignty can be shared between different levels of governance. That's I mean, it's not a nice just way of saying you're taking away economic sovereignty. No, I mean, it's also you know if you look at, at federal states, federal nation states, such as Germany, for instance. I mean, there is also a lot of sharing of responsibility downwards. So you know, it's not only the central state that is the the one and well, only. Of course, you have local democracy, of course, but. But I mean, you, yeah, you can't you, share you can sovereignty. Have, you I mean, I can't share the democracy sovereignty as well. of my body, or no, no country can share its sovereignty unless it is taken away from it. Of course, that we, of course, we devolve certain powers down to a local level, or for instance, in the UK, we do it to, to, to Scotland or Wales, etc. Of course, that takes place. But at the point where you give away economic sovereignty, it's not really sharing it. I mean, you, you've handed it over, you've centralised it, you've moved away from from that central maxim that no man should have power enforced over him unless he has been part of formulating that power. This is the bulwark against tyranny. This is our, our best defence for democracy. And everything that the EU is moves power away in the opposite direction towards centralization rather than localism. Well, I, I wouldn't agree. I mean, what you say is basically assuming that the natural place of sovereignty is the nation state mm. and that uh, so moving it somewhere else is, is unnatural. I don't, I don't agree with that. I think, I think the sovereignty can be put on different levels and where it actually suits it. I mean, if you look at, at Europe, at European Union, for instance, as an economic area, in the, in the global economy we're moving into, it is just hilarious frankly, to think that any European country, Britain, Germany, France, on their own, could have any say in any of the dealings and how the, how the system is going to work on a global level going forward. I mean, that's just, that's just wishful thinking. Absolutely. So it I makes, it makes sense to pool sovereignty there, to have a bigger voice on the stage that we're actually playing. You know, when people say this, I never quite understand what it is they want to do with their great big voice on the international stage. Uh, frankly, I think most of um, Britain's problems have been that it's gone through history thinking, oh, well, we must have a big voice on the world stage. I don't see what Britain has ever gotten out of that situation. It's mostly sent its men to slaughter for this idea of having a greater role role in the international stage. And anyway, I actually don't undervalue Britain's um, importance and its vitality and dynamism as a nation to think that on its own it would be incapable of achieving those well, things. Well, let me bring up an example is in terms of negotiating trade agreements with China. Uh, very important for Britain in terms of our, you know, being a historically a nation very reliant on trade, particularly at the moment with all the issues about the economy and the state of, state of the jobs market and, and, and levels of exports and so on. When it comes to negotiating with China, Britain can have a much more effective negotiating position if it's in with other members of the EU and therefore is in a stronger negotiating position than if it's on its own. Now, there is a degree of sharing absolutely there of saying, well, OK, collectively we have to agree a negotiating position, but we also get something back in return because that negotiating position that we collectively agree on and we give away a little bit in that sense, what we get back is it's a stronger negotiating position we get more and from. And this is a very old right-wing idea, which is that our trade interests take precedence over democracy and, and over the internal coherence of your political system. And actually, we see this all the way. You see this in Victorian is, you know, trade, trade is what matters. And for that, we'll be willing to scrap democracy. And at the heart of the EU, again, is that idea. And, and you're espousing it now. And well, I, I, used to, I imagine I, I used it as one example. But, but I think actually it, it, you know, it doesn't run against democracy uh, if the way the EU operates gives appropriate power to the European Parliament. Yeah. So one of the things I'm very keen on seeing is the European Parliament having more power because the European Parliament is elected by peoples of Europe, at least those who choose to take I mean, part in the elections, but it, it provides is, but a, of, but a democratic them, input. But there. none of them vote for it. And then there's a reason that nobody votes in European uh, parliamentary elections here. And when Brits do, of course, they just chuck Nigel Farage and his minions in there so that they can shout at everybody for the next four years, which isn't a you know, particularly constructive way to go about it either. The reason that people don't vote is because they associate quite strongly with a national state. Now, we can pretend that this is something that we don't want or that isn't ideal for humans. It doesn't really matter what we think, you know, no matter how idealistic we get. That's how people associate with a cultural linguistic grouping. So in England, when money gets sent, of course, from the south to the north all the time through taxation, there's a lopsided relationship there. Nobody complains. When the Germans are asked to send money to Greece, suddenly it's, oh, they're incredibly feckless and lazy because there's no cultural association there. The cultural association is with the nation state. Well, people within countries also complain about, about transfers. Mm, but let's definitely. stick with the, before we come to the democracy argument, which I'm sure we will, but let's stick with the reasoning for, sovereign, for pooling sovereignty. I mean, some, especially in, on, the, on the British Eurosceptic side, seem to think, really, that Britain on its own could negotiate better deals uh, than the, the continent on its own. I mean, that's just a ludicrous position. Uh, am I, am I in this, here? Uh, this yeah, sure. discussion has nothing to do with the 
disarmament idea of the price, to, and the EU is uh, uh, completely against the plan of Nobel to have a global system of demilitarized nations. And the EU is pursuing traditional military strength and power games and, uh, and in competition with other international actors, uh, like uh, standing up to the U.S. militarily, and so, et cetera, et cetera. It has absolutely nothing to do with the peace prize. It's, in, in fact, the direct opposite policies of the, those Nobel had in mind. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London with me, Daniel Sinner. Joining me for a discussion on the Nobel Peace Prize are Ian Dunt, editor of politics.co.uk. Dr Henning Mayer is a senior visiting fellow at the London School of Economics and Political Science and also the editor of the Social Europe Journal. Mark Pack is co-editor of the Liberal Democrat Voice. And Friedrich Heffermal is the author of the Nobel Peace Prize, What Nobel Really Wanted. You heard from Mark Pack, who said it's developed now. What Nobel had has now been developed by his descendants and generations on. Yeah, but this is uh, the price is much more imperative uh, necessity and urgency today than in his time. He was hesitant because he thought maybe to demand disarmament was a bit too much, too far ahead of his period, and he was afraid that it wouldn't be taken really seriously. But at the time. He wrote his will Uh, at the time he decided. He said this is a price for global disarmament. Politics in Norway or in Europe or in U.S. or everywhere changes. The price is still for the purpose that the stater had in mind. Sure, Friedrich, would you think that um, Alfred Nobel would have wanted this prize to go towards an institution? No, I think the, uh, the, I, 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 it actually he had persons in mind. There's no doubt about it. But I, I think you shouldn't be too uh, particular about all the various technical things like last year, efforts last year, and so on, so on. But the one thing which is very important and cannot be changed, that is the purpose he had in mind. And the, 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 the price as it is today is a complete fake, it's a fraud. Uh, and it's all it's criminal they know they have been explained exactly what the mandate is and they don't care at all they just uh, overwhelm it with massive media hype and uh, it's really a scandal of proportions Uh, it is certainly i mean it's certainly part of a pr campaign where the eu is in its most i think everyone would agree with this where you know the eu is in incredible trouble it's probably been subject to some of the most critical coverage you know in, in its history and there is a growing assumption that it, that it has failed and that it's creating a, a potentially disastrous effect on the continent. And I think in that context, probably it is a bit of a PR exercise to kind of you know, bulk up some of, some of the support that the EU might get and, and talk about what people will associate. Obviously, I disagree, but you know, lots of people do think that it is responsible for the peace of the last half century in Europe. So in that respect, yes, I mean, it, it does seem like the prize is being given as a PR exercise rather than out of any genuine forensic analysis of what it's achieved or what it might do in the future. How do you feel about an institution being given a prize as opposed to people or...? I I really don't care. Okay, Mark Pack. Likewise, I'm not particularly fussed one way or the other. I think there are often occasions where there are amazing individuals who don't get enough sort of attention and credit and so on. But actually the nature of the Nobel Peace Prize is to have done something on a sufficient scale, even if you're an individual, is you will have got that sort of credit and attention and so on. So I think with, you know, things like the sort of New Year's honours and so on, it's it's really important to hunt out the people you might have otherwise not heard of. Uh, but with the Nobel Peace right. Prize, I think whether it's individual or whether it's, it, it's an institution, the issue is much more about what the person or the collective group of people have achieved. Dr Mayer, we're looking at achievements here from what Mark Packer said. If we go on to the democracy side that you wanted to speak about before. Well, the EU is obviously a governance system in the making. It is the most developed uh, supranational governance system there is. And it's a model, to be quite frank, also for other regions of the of the earth who are who are trying to uh, build regional groupings from ASEAN to Mercosur and and, and the like. Obviously, it's always a, you know a, a transformation process. But if you look, for instance, at the European Parliament, ever since it was introduced in 1979, it has gained more powers. It has gained more co-decision rights. So, and I hope this continues because that will make the European Union more democratic. But you can't possibly. I mean, it's, okay. So, so your argument is. We're going to have regional clusters of countries organized on a transnational organization scale. And you, but you accept, of course, that it, 
presume, I mean, you must accept that, you know, where, where there's economic, where you're giving up economic sovereignty, you also have to give up political sovereignty, yes, given what we're seeing. Yeah. So really, it, for you to say that, you know, we're, we're, this is a good for democracy, that we're going to have all the countries in the world s losing political power, losing economic power towards a central organization, organized by what? By continent. So one for Africa, one for... That sounds yeah, like a democratic itself, but it's disaster. It's not right? a democratic disaster. Your premise is democracy only rests in the nation state, and I don't agree with this. You can have the European Parliament, which is a democratically elected parliament. You might say it doesn't have enough rights, and it doesn't, doesn't express... Uh, you know, it's not strong enough vis-a-vis -vis other European Union institutions. I think that's a fair point, and you can make this. But you can't say, in my view, that the, the, the natural... Again, we're talking about natural places... You seem to suggest that the natural place of sovereignty and the natural place of democracy is the nation state. And but it, it doesn't matter what I think. I, as it happens, I do actually think, you know, it, it's a perfectly good forum. Why not stick to it? That would be my opinion. It's not a massive, you know, I'm not going to go with a lion and a unicorn and start singing. However, it doesn't really matter what I think. What matters is what people think. And you would have to have a very imaginative argument to suggest that the people of Europe associate more strongly with the European Parliament than they do with their own Parliament. There's a bit difference now as well. Now you're talking about identity. Identity is obviously part of democracy, mm. yeah, but it is obviously a building as well. And people have multi-level identities. Mm. I, I do agree that we have always had a problem with a European demos or the lack of it, and we, that we do have to develop European democracy, and that it is a challenge in governance terms to create a supranational grouping from scratch, from a war-ridden continent that so has, at that the point has that a democracy. So you're recognizing that you've got problems with it, why are you suggesting that we should expand it? Because it's work in the making and it's going into the right direction, broadly speaking. If you look at the response now to the Eurozone... Of course. I mean, it doesn't look at, that way. Just look at the one thing now about the Eurozone crisis. I mean, we can go into the structural and economic details uh, much further if, if we have the time to. <laughs> but the, uh, but the, the problem here is, is a structural, is a structural uh, problem. And it can only be solved with a political union. I've written quite a few articles about this, but the point is, the point is that we have to create this political union now, and that's the that's the way apparently people also want to move in the eurozone. I, I do accept that. How we're do you not know that? I mean, whenever people vote, I'm, I'm because sorry, they half the time they vote. No, France voted no, Netherlands voted no. Nobody pays any attention. Ireland votes, votes no until they make them vote for it. In well, the but end. you're confusing different things now. We're talking about the reform of the eurozone. All countries want to keep the majority want to keep the euro. Yeah, they want to keep the euro and they want to make it work, and that's where we're moving into. Unfortunately, we're coming up to the end of the discussion now, uh, we're going to get a final word from Mark Pack. I would just say in terms of the comment that was made earlier about, you know, where is the natural level of the sort of, you know, is it the nation state that people in instinctively think about, is if you take that wider global perspective, if you look, you know, further east of Europe or south of Europe, the nation state isn't the level that people naturally associate with, partly because of all the problems of you know, history and colonialism and where the boundaries were drawn and so on. But people are used to the idea there are lots of different levels that they associate with. And you see that within Britain as well. You know, even the most hardened Eurosceptic of golfing fan quite happily cheers Europe on when it comes to the Ryder Cup. It's possible to uh, enjoy being part of communities at all sorts of different levels simultaneously. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time for today's discussion on the Nobel Peace Prize. Joining me were Ian Dunt, editor of politics.co.uk, Dr Henning Mayer at the London School of Economics and Political Science, Mark Pack is co-editor of the Liberal Democrat Voice, and Friedrich Hafermel is author of the Nobel Peace Prize, What Nobel Really Wanted. Ooh.